seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, for those of you just joining us on the live stream, and for those of you who just walked in, uh, I am very excited about this next speaker, Dr. Sherry Walling. Um, for those of you who have come to a lot of word camps, you see a lot of really great topics on development and businessing and all sorts of fun things. This is a treat. Uh, not a lot of people uh, uh, talk about the, these types of subjects. We have Corey Miller in the community who does that. We have uh, Sean Hesketh who, who does a lot of good work in this area as well. Um, but uh, what Dr. Walling is doing is absolutely incredible. So um, she comes to us with over 10 years of dealing with entrepreneurs. Before that, she held many uh, numerous faculty uh, appointed positions at universities. And um, she's worked with PTSD folks coming back from service. Imagine for me, I think that's the best qualification at all to deal with entrepreneurs because, you know, I can't, I can't equate it to what happens when you serve our country, but at the same time, you get that feeling of, I'm so alone and I'm so dealing with so much, how can I do that? So I'm very proud that she was able to join us today and very happy. Uh, without any further ado, Dr. Sherry Walling. Thank you, Kareem. <laughs> um, so I, I was here last year and gave a presentation in this room. And I had all this like tech drama, like I didn't have the right dongles and I just, you know, I was a little bit flustered. And so I, in my professional life, help people who are flustered and upset calm down. That's like sort of my job. So I'm like, okay, I got this, like I can do this. So I got the microphone, I stood here, I took a deep breath, and I sat down and sort of prepared myself. Except, unfortunately, this table is on wheels. So my Zen moment was like, oh, okay, try not to fall. So I think, <laughs> here we are again, I'll try not to fall. Sometimes really good ideas don't work out so well. Sometimes we have a good sense of what we need to do or how we need to show up for our work, but it doesn't work out the way that we expect or the way that we think it's going to work. And that's a little bit of what my talk is today. So as, as Kareem mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I spend a lot of time helping upset people calm down. And in the past couple of years, I've worked almost exclusively with founders, with executives, with freelancers, with folks who are doing the very difficult job of carving out their own unique path in life. And that path, as you well know, is entirely dependent on you. If you're gonna be successful in business, it's because you have an ability to solve problems in a unique way, to communicate effectively with others. You have a set of expertise, you have a set of skills, you have something inside you that helps you get your work done. You have a drive, you have discipline. You have all of the things that go into getting up, doing the work, shipping, selling it to someone, and repeating the next day. So that is very much a psychological process. So I get to talk to folks about the psychological process that drives their ability to do their work. And my work has kind of two components. One is I'm a doctor, I get called in when things go wrong. So when you have someone who is flaming out, they're burnt out, they are struggling with depression, you have two co-founders who can't get along, you have a team that's imploding, so I help solve those problems. But the other thing that I get to do, and what we're kind of doing here today, is I get to try to help prevent those problems. Because believe it or not, we have pretty good information about human functioning and human flourishing. We know what contributes to burnout. We know what makes our brains fractured and inefficient. And we can reverse engineer those problems and try to figure out, hey, what do we do? How do we act 
what choices do we make so that we're optimizing for wellness and minimizing the chance that we are going to end our business career in flames. So the premise here is that your business depends on you. And this is a little bit of the sort of 10,000 foot view. I'm gonna invite you into the process of thinking about your own thinking. We call that metacognition, fancy words. But when we develop the capacity to be self-reflective, to understand our own patterns, to observe our own emotional life, we can use that self-reflective capacity as kind of a superpower in business. Because we need to understand, of course, our clients and the context of our work, but we also need to understand our part of the equation. So I wanna talk through five seemingly good ideas that might not be good ideas. Five seemingly good ideas that might end with you sitting on the floor in the stage of WordCamp because you sat on a table that had wheels on it. So the first one I wanna talk about is the idea, my business is my baby. And I don't know if any of you have babies or have had a baby or knew a baby, but they're kind of demanding. And they really require a lot of attention, really a lot, especially at the beginning when your whole life is organized around keeping them alive. And that's really not that different from what it's like to start a business in the first couple of years you're really just trying to like keep it alive, feed it, make sure it sleeps, like make sure you just do all the things to keep it alive. And so, you know, you might be thinking, I clearly know the difference between a cuddly wally little baby, a little mini human, and my business. <laughs> but guys, maybe not. So um, a team of researchers in Finland did a research study where they asked the question, is entrepreneurial love the same as parental love? And they must know entrepreneurs to have come up with that research question. So what they did is they used functional MRI scans. They looked inside the brain while the brain was thinking about certain cues to try to see how well the neurological process of thinking about one's child mapped on to the neurological process of thinking about one's business. And it may or may not surprise you to learn that they are strikingly similar in two particular ways. So when business owners are thinking about their business, there's a part of the brain, the striatum, which is the reward center of the brain, that's very active. And this is the part of the brain, basically, that, that feels good. When we feel like mushy and gushy towards our significant other or towards our child, we have this little dopamine hit. Our brain lights up and it, it feels good. That's what's happening in our brains when we're thinking about our businesses. There's an attachment. It's not unlike love. The other piece of this, or the other significant finding from this study, the other part of the brain that is not activated but is suppressed is the posterior cingulate cortex and the temporal parietal junction, which clearly you know. Um, <laughs> Those are parts of the brain that help with mentalization. So when I am standing up here communicating with you, there, my brain is reading your faces and is anticipating if you're bored, if you're interested, and I'm adjusting myself to you. Social referencing. So I'm getting inside your brain a little bit and adjusting so this is the part of the brain that doesn't function super well when it comes to founders, entrepreneurs, freelancers, whatever word you want to use, and their businesses. It means that we are so close to our businesses that it is very hard for us to engage in critical assessment. Our businesses on a neurological level feel like an extension of us we don't perceive them as separate entities. 
they feel like our like left arm. So our brain is not well equipped to really engage in objective, critical assessment. So that's kind of a tough spot. So you've built your livelihood on this thing that you love dearly, and you really think it's like the cutest, smartest child ever, and you're really very biased. So what that means is if you want to be able to kind of optimize your ability to be successful in your business, to some extent, you have to build in some mechanisms for critical assessment that honor the fact that you're biased, that it's very hard for you to be objective. That can mean a mastermind group. That can mean simply the awareness that you're going to have a leaning when you look at your business data. So there are strategies that you will have to develop based on who you are and who your business is and the resources that are available to you to make sure that you're getting as much objective data as you can. The other thing to do to kind of mitigate this good idea that has the potential to go bad is to diversify the things that you love. Because when you think about the deep attachment that you have to your business, and how like a demanding little baby it has the potential to be, there's the possibility for you to get really eaten up by your love for this business. Because as you know, business is an up and down game. Sometimes it's going super well and you're riding high, it's euphoric, you feel super successful and proud of what you've made. And other times you're really not sure if you're gonna make payroll. And the ups and downs are part of the journey. They are part of the entrepreneurial life. But if you can have other parts of your life that you also love, whether that's friends or family or community or a bowling league, something else that helps to kind of buffer you from the ups and downs of that deep attachment that you might have to your business. Make sense? All right, number two, hustle. Good idea sometimes goes bad. And believe me, I am no stranger to hard work and hustle and getting things done and making things happen. So I'm not hating on those of you who are in the grind and are staying up late and getting up early because I know that that's also part of the game. But sometimes it goes wrong. For most of us, it can be frenetic and a little chaotic and probably not super sustainable. And when we hustle without being careful, we are very susceptible to the mastery of the mighty squirrel, which means that we can be all over the place. So you combine this get there faster, go, 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 hustle mentality with an inability to be very, assess, like very objective or critically assess your business, and you can find yourself really going full speed ahead in lots of directions all at one time, which sounds like it could be good, but it's actually not possible, and it significantly damages the way that our brains function. We are not, our brains, at least at this point in our evolutionary journey, are really not like equipped well to multitask. We think we are, but essentially we're not. We're fragmenting. So one of the best books that I've read recently is a book called Deep Work, which outlines this kind of problem and then outlines some great strategies and simple solutions that can help guide how to work well. And essentially the premise of deep work is that if you're gonna do your best, most creative, most innovative, whether you're coding, whether you're designing, whether you're writing sales copy, whatever it is that you're doing in your, in your work, let yourself go all in on that task. Be immersive. Turn off Slack. Turn off all the bells and whistles and things. Turn off your email. Turn off your Wi-Fi. Let yourself really focus on those higher order cognitive tasks that require your most complicated brain abilities because that is how you are going to do your best work. Innovative ideas, genius, those things don't happen when we're going a million miles a minute in lots of different directions. So you save yourself mistakes you save yourself fatigue, you save yourself time spent on things that really don't move the needle forward when you let yourself deeply focus. 
And the other piece of this, is course, of course, is choosing carefully how you spend your effort, knowing that you're, you are the resource and you are finite. So carefully choosing what you give your energy to. You can only do a couple things well. And so being very shrewd and careful in the kinds of decisions that you're making about where you're going to give your energy to in your business. Because hustle is fine. We're all going to have some late nights and some early mornings and sometimes when you just have to bust your booty to get it done. But if that's the way that you live, you aren't going to last long in this world. You aren't going to last long in this life of, of being a freelancer or running your own business. Number three. I love my customers, and they love me. So everybody loves to be loved. That's how we're kind of wired as humans, for belonging, for affection, for connection. And the idea is that you develop some way of doing your business that people are just over the moon about, and they are, you know, beating down the door to hire you or to pay for your service. But that's not the reality. How many of you have ever gotten some kind of critical feedback about your professional work? Yeah. How many of you have 100% satisfaction for all customers ever? That dude. <laughs> you, well, you're doing well. <laughs> He's two for two, satisfaction guaranteed. <laughs> so the truth is that we are going to hear very negative feedback from our customers about the choices that we make or the way that we do things. And given our, if we're honest, our emotional attachment to our work, to our business. I mean, when you are doing these things, you're putting yourself out there, right? This is your idea, your design, your code, your brain, your unique sort of stamp on the world that you're giving to someone else, and they're like, eh, could it be blue? <laughs> it's painful. It's painful. And you do it over and over. You sell yourself over and over and over and over and over again. That's what it means. And hopefully, if you do it more times, more than two, but you're doing well, um, that's how you build a successful business. But that vulnerability over and over and over, we have to be honest about sort of the toll that that can take over time. And someday we can do a round table of like all of the crappy things that customers and clients have said to us, because I'm sure there are some zingers. And how do we both protect ourselves from that, but also learn from it? Those are the things that will, again, sort of help you be successful or not successful in your business. So the first thing is that we really have to get as comfortable as we can with discomfort. We have to be able to tolerate it. And one of the reasons that this is important is because it's your unhappy customers that are your most powerful teachers. Your happy customers probably don't give you a lot of feedback except high five, you're great, here's the check. Those are great customers. But if you wanna get better, if you wanna expand your reach or your service, if you wanna be able to serve a broader audience of people, it's the grumbly people who might have some actually really helpful feedback for you. And it's not easy to listen to. So, how do we like, you know, kind of buffer ourselves, bolster ourselves? Sometimes I actually have people visualize putting on a shield or like a suit of armor to go into certain meetings with unhappy people. Because it's okay, you can take the feedback and not let it kind of penetrate into your soul. But it does take some practice to be able to tolerate unhappy people and learn from them and listen to them without it, it hurting you too much. The other suggestion I have for minimizing the uh, adversity of this is to really filter feedback, right? We have to choose who we listen to. And rather than either shutting down critical feedback or only hearing critical feedback, 
we have to be able to sort of take all of the feedback and balance it to some extent. So I really had to practice this recently. I, in the end of February, uh, released a book, which I was very excited about, and people began to review it on Amazon. And there are like 20-something beautiful, lovely reviews about how the book was helpful. And then there's one person who was basically like, this is a little painful. He's like, this book is self-indulgent and empathy-seeking. And I was like, I don't even know what you mean. I don't like your review. I don't like you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't my mom. I don't think. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it was her mom. We're going to talk later. So I have to tolerate that. And I have to understand that for some people who think they're going to read a business book, reading stories of people emotion, people's emotional life might not be what they wanted, might not be what they thought they were getting. That's cool. I can maybe think about how I can articulate what my book is about in a way that makes people have informed consent. It has like a big sign on it that's like, there's going to be feelings here. So people will know. So it wasn't my favorite experience, but you know, you take the feedback and you sort of think about what you can do. But the thing that I was tempted to do was only listen to that one and not let myself sort of sit with the 25 other ones to be overly biased in the negative interpretation. And that's because the minute that happens, the minute there's a critical tweet or somebody gives us bad feedback, our, our cortisol kicks in. We go into this fight or flight response and we're really attuned to the potential threat of someone being unhappy with us. Oh, but the reality is that probably most of our customers are happy enough or we would not be in business. And to hold the negative with the full range of the positive and kind of hold them in balance. To be like 85% happy and then allow yourself to integrate the critical feedback and see what you can take. And if it's just like a really loony person who is not able to be constructive, then it's okay to dismiss it. But we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking like, in order to be successful, people love us and we love them. Because that is not a good metric, guys. That's not going to happen. Maybe for that guy, but not for everybody. <laughs> OK. Number four, this is a nice positive statement. I got this. And I like it. I like lots of things about this. And sometimes I say it to myself right when I'm trying not to fall on the table. But you know, you sort of affirm, I got this. I'm OK. I'm OK here. A couple little tweaks you might want to make. The first is something that um, Pat talked about. This is the we language. Even if you are a solo founder, even if it's just you and the dog in the basement doing your thing, there's still a we involved. You probably maybe have a significant other. Maybe you had a mentor. Maybe you have some subcontractors. Maybe you have people that said nice things to you when you were in fifth grade, which gives you the courage to try to do something hard. When you sort of understand yourself and your business as a community effort, then I think that also feels like you have these other sources of support when things go wrong. So the more that you're eye-focused, the less buffer you have and the less support you have when things do go wrong. So just this little adjustment in language I think can be helpful. The other part of this statement that I don't love as you know, like an affirmation to repeat to yourself is the, the got this part. It sort of implies this arrival and doesn't give quite the nod to ongoing continuous growth that I think is important when we think about how to sustain successful business over time. So a reframe might be, we're learning this. We're growing in this way. We're so excited about where, where things are going in the future. But the gut is sort of this final um, not very dynamic way of viewing your success. One of the things that we do um, 
sometimes psychological researchers do is we look at semantic analysis. We look at the way that people use language. So for example, people who are really struggling with depression use language very differently than people who are not struggling with depression. They use a lot more um, singular, like I pronouns, and then they use a lot more negative emotion words, as you could imagine. I have a theory, which I haven't tested, but maybe someday, that successful entrepreneurs, people who really rock it in business, use a lot of emerging active verbs. Growing, learning, climbing, reaching, running, jumping, climbing trees. But instead of these sort of like finite, static words. So someday I'll test that hypothesis. But for now, I would just say if you find yourself using the generally very you know, helpful statement, I got this, maybe just give it a little bit of a tweak and remind yourself that the best thing you have going for you in business is your ability to grow and adapt and be flexible and keep moving. And some of those active words can be a nice, important shift and switch for you. All right, last one. Disclaimer, we're going to talk about feelings. And I said that a little bit jokingly, but I do think that there is some confusion about the parameters of what's professionalism, what's business, and understanding ourselves as whole beings. So when we try to overly, to make things overly objective, we fail to take into account our own internal emotional experiences. And this is actually quite dangerous from my perspective as a psychologist. This is how people work in a job or work in a business for years and years on end and wake up one day and realize, I have no idea what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and I hate my life. And those, those moments happen to people. Maybe they've happened to you. It creeps up on you, though. It creeps up when you're not paying attention, when your head's down, hustle, and you're not asking the big questions of like, is this meaningful to me? Do I enjoy this? Is this how I want to be spending my relatively few days that I get on this planet? So I think that this is one of the most important practices that, that entrepreneurs can do, is to really track your emotional life. So there's lots of ways to do this. And I just think that of this as another metric, right? You're looking at unique visitors to your website. You're looking at downloads. You're looking at all kinds of metrics. You got spreadsheets and things, numbers. This is another source of metric where you're tracking the high points of your life, the low points of your life. You're looking at your to-do list in a given day, and you're putting like a smiley face or a frowny face next to those activities. And I'm being a little bit playful, but I'm actually not. Because when you get a sense of your emotional engagement with each of the activities that make up your business life, you're getting really important information about your sweet spots, where you're excited, where you have passion, where you have energy, and the kinds of things that are like sucking the life out of you. And guess what? You're going to do better work when you've got energy and enthusiasm and passion and ideas and not such good work when you're going through the motions and you're feeling exhausted and drained. So when you get to the point that you are ready to hire and grow your team, take all of those frowny face items and write that into a job description and hand that off. Because you want to optimize for your own well-being. Remember, it all comes back to you. And I think the whole point, honestly, of what I do and why I do it is to help remind people to pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on inside of you. Pay attention to what you're learning. Pay attention to what you love and what you don't love. Be curious about your own self so that you can be the best version of whatever it is that you do, the best copywriter, the best designer, the best coder. Because there's a lot of genius in this room, right? If we look around, like there's, 
there's some interesting life stories, some interesting experiences, some folks who have innovative, creative, cool ways of thinking. And when we fail to let our own selves flourish, we rob ourselves of the satisfaction of a life that is um, congruent and authentic, but we also rob the community. So as a group, as a community of people, whether that's WordPress or Miami or however you slice your community, we need the best version of you. So be aware of the creep. Be aware of good ideas that have the potential to go wrong. And give yourselves the space to really enjoy and love what you do so that you can do it for a long time and make a lot of money and be generous and helpful and flourish and buy a boat or whatever it is that you want to do with yourself. Okay? Um, I do a weekly podcast. It's a lot of uh, content and ideas about the kinds of topics that we talked about today. It's free. Lots of free resources at the Zen Founder website. So if you are in the early process of starting a business or you're in the middle of the slog or you're thinking about it, um, my husband Rob and I have attempted to come up with a lot of material and resources to help you do that well and stay sane and be happy and all those things. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Oh. You're not done yet. Okay. Hold on, guys. So uh, Sherry brought with her today five copies of her book, Keeping Your Stuff Together. Um, I would just like to say that my son, who's 11, named the book. Right? I don't know where he heard that kind of language. <laughs> Probably from his father. <laughs> So, WordCamp rules, we can't give it away, but I can make you work for it. So, uh, I really highly recommend this book. It's incredible. Um, I know a few audience members have already read it, and I think they'll tell you the same. So, here's what we're going to do. Um, hopefully, everybody here either has Twitter or Slack from WordCamp Miami. So... Please, if you can ask a question that we can get to in the panel that refers to anything you've heard so far or Josh, when he comes up on stage next, we will go through those questions in our panel and the questions that get picked will get a copy of the book. So, please, in Twitter, if you're using Twitter, hashtag WCMIA, hashtag MBA, two different hashtags. Or if you're in Slack in the general, in the general channel, uh, please tag uh, Ryan, R-I-A-N, Kinney. Um, and we will get your questions. Clear? Do I need to repeat it? Nope, got it? Cool. Um, those of you watching the live stream, um, I will make the commitment that if I get one of the questions from you that I can use on, on Twitter, I'll get you a copy of the book. Um, up, up to one or two, so we'll see which <laughs> ones I use. Um, all right, so that's the book. Um, so, so far, let's talk about where we, we've been so far. We have talked about everything from how to think about starting the business. Then we went to how to start dealing with your first customers and clients. And then we started talking about how are you gonna actually work through some of these things. And these five tips that you came up with are absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, I, I actually was taking notes because, you know, I, I tend to try and make sure that I'm paying attention. And um, I love the Eddie Izzard quote, running, jumping, climbing trees. Can you tell us a little bit about what is it about staying active that will help your growth, or what is it about that part that just will help the entrepreneur uh, expand what they're doing? Because I, I read an article that you tweeted that talked about um, uh, roughhousing. 
what does roughhousing have to do with running my business? I mean, you, you all know very well how dynamic changes in WordPress or in markets can threaten the well-being of your business or can be opportunities to expand. I think the thing that gets dangerous in many ways is when we, we are stuck or we hold still too long. That's kind of true in business and true in life. So the more that you understand yourself and your business as an, an active, dynamic, malleable, adaptable entity, I think you're less jarred when the thing that you have built has to shift because of these external forces. I don't know if that makes sense, but or answers yeah. your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have to stay agile. Right. So. Another thing that a lot of folks don't realize is um, the basic building blocks. Can you give us an idea of what it takes to actually come to work every morning and like be present? Yeah, so sometimes there's a couple of different talks that I've given and one of the talks that I've, I've given a couple times you know, I ask people, like, what do you take away? Or people will say at the end of the conference, what's the thing that you took away from, from what Sherry presented? And they're like, that I need to sleep more. And I'm like, yeah, like your mom probably told you that, but I'm going to tell you again. So if we want to show up to our work with our brains functioning at their best capacity, there are a couple of things that really have to be in place. And we call these kind of the building blocks of sanity. You have to get enough sleep. There's really compelling amount of science that looks at what happens to our brains when we don't sleep well or sleep enough. One of the highlights is that our neurons start to die. Another highlight is that our hippocampus, which is sort of one of the mechanisms for maintaining memory, doesn't have time to practice new information. So if we're not sleeping, we're really actually not learning. So sleep is one of the building blocks that really have to be in place. The other is you have to fuel yourself well. So, you know, donuts and coffee don't work for three meals a day every day of your life. It's not going to work for your brain. And then the last thing is movement, is exercise. And this doesn't have to, you don't have to, like, go sign up for CrossFit. In order to help your brain function optimally, you have to move 30 minutes, three times a week. And that means an elevated heart rate and sort of some glistening sweat beads. So if you're not a gym person and you don't want to be a gym person, that's fine. But your ability to move regularly is, is a really significant predictor of how well your brain will function, therefore how well you'll be, you know, you'll be able to do in your business. Okay. Thank you. Now, last question. If I wanted to know more about this, where do I go? <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> Zenfounder.com? I wrote it down. I talked about it. Zenfounder.com? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Three down. Two more sessions to go. Next, we're going to be hearing in a few minutes from Josh Strebel founder and CEO of Pagely Hosting. It's an awesome story. A uh, couple of reminders as we give people a few minutes to take a bathroom break or just, you know, stretch. Um, before we do our, our panel, we will be doing a quick exercise, warning you right now, but nothing deep, nothing hard. Um, and it's going to be an absolutely incredible afternoon. I thank you all for working with us and, and being here and listening to all this, and I hope you find it valuable. Thank you.